Please welcome former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, Mary Beth Long. Good morning, and thank everyone for being here. I particularly want to thank Senator Brownback and all the organizations and institutions to coming for something that is so easily overlooked, but so important. I started my life in the Central Intelligence Agency as an operations officer abroad, and I finished up my government career um, as the Assistant Secretary responsible for just about every conflict area you can imagine. And there are two things that you cannot help but come away with after those experiences. And number one is religious intolerance is coupled almost always with an intolerance for basic human rights, for liberties, for the fundamentals of humanity. And those who claim religious backing, religious motivation for terrorism, not only embrace it, but they use that to the detriment of all. There are so many conflicts, whether it's a local terrorist seeing a political divide or an economic divide and manipulating people to use his religious backing or his alleged religious guidance to motivate people to violence, or whether it's just the lack of belonging and the need for religion or the need for tolerance of not being religion or not being religious that really undermines our humanity. And they are fundamental to the instability and the lack of peacekeeping in the world. Religious tolerance is coupled and embedded in all of that, number one. Number two, tolerance for religion and the role that religion and groups and faith plays is fundamental to resolving conflict. And what we need going forward in the world is more participation on the ground, more inclusion of the private sector, more strengthening, as Secretary Pompeo said, of using belief to not only avoid conflict, phase zero from a military standpoint, but then to resolve it on the ground. And that is why the coupling, the intersection of international religious freedom and our national security, the world's national security and national security policy, while overlooked, is really important, never more important than now. Think about it. We wake up today very different than we woke up just a year or two ago, very different than post-World War II, very different even than after the Cold War. Conflict is everywhere. It's increasing. The kinds of conflict and threats are increasing, and the domains. We now have danger in the very air we breathe in, in the internet. And yet, we're more divided and more divisive than ever before. There has got to be a recognized role for unity, for faith, for human rights, and for religion, and not only avoiding, but resolving these conflicts. And that's what we're here to talk about today. With me on the panel are two people that have dedicated a lot of their lives, and certainly in some respects his security, to integrating faith and faith-based and unity into the world and calling out those who would use religion and use violence to separate us. Do you think it's not really happening and it's not really a military issue? What about what the Taliban is doing to women and others? in Afghanistan? What about the intolerance in Pakistan that has led to beheadings and permanent jailing? What about the rise of ISIS in Syria and other African nations? What's going on in Nigeria, which the Secretary just talked about? What about the persecution of Uyghurs by the Chinese? What about the, the, the lack of unity and the, and the use of faith in what is happening now in Ukraine with the Russian basically invading that country and cloaking themselves in religion. I realize it's a hot topic, but I also realize that without us belonging, without unity in religion and faith, we have violence, we have destruction, we have lack of humanity, we have lack of recognition of human rights, and eventually we have genocide. And that has got to stop. I'd like to call upon my other panel members to talk about how they see that playing a role looking forward. With me today is Sir David Alton from Liverpool, 
who have recently wrote a book um, that actually criticized China and the Uyghurs, and he's been sanctioned by China because of it. Lord Alton. And with me, too, is Ms. Nicole, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, Bibbins Sadaka. I want to say Bibbins Sadaka. I was asking, are you related to Neil Sadaka? He is. But Nicole has had a long and distinguished career, not only in government, but she is the executive vice president of Freedom House, and she has some interesting ideas about the role of the private sector in conflict resolution. Please. I note that contrary to our national security strategy for the United States, uh, which previously listed religious freedom as one of our founding principles of our national security strategy, our security strategy, that no longer is the case in the current draft document. And I think Secretary Pompeo alluded to that. Um, I wanted to ask each of the panelists in general, what role do you see religious freedom playing in national security and most importantly, going forward in this crazy, ever-evolving threat environment that we have. Do you see it getting worse, getting better, and are there any lights at the end of the tunnel? I'm gonna go with ladies first. Absolutely. Lord, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Nicole? Well, let me just say first, thank you very much um, for this summit being convened. It's extraordinarily important that we come together to talk about this issue. Thank you, Mary Beth, for your leadership, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's just such an important topic to really think about the intersection of two extraordinarily important issues. We are in a world which is changing rapidly and is becoming more insecure as we, as we speak, and we've seen things which we thought were no longer things we would see in the modern world happening in Russia and in many places around the world. We also are in an era of 16 years of democratic decline around the world, which means that there are more countries in which freedoms are being restricted, increasingly restricted, than there are countries in which freedom is expanding. And so it's really important for us to dig into those. So let me just share, if I could, just a few of the trends that um, that I have been seeing and that I think underpin this intersection between um, religious freedom and national security, and then gave maybe a, a nugget of hope at the end. Um, you know, with 84% of the world's population identifying as religiously affiliated in some way is extraordinarily important that we ask ourselves when we're thinking about the global landscape, about foreign policy, about national security, what role does religious freedom, what role do people of faith play in that? So I wanna make three points about where I am seeing this intersection that we really need to focus on for those of us who are in the foreign policy and national security sphere. The first is unrestrained authoritarian power, which we are seeing increasing around the world at a pace that is deeply concerning. We know that religious liberty is limited primarily in those countries with authoritarian leadership. And what we also know is that that is part of a suite of repressive measures. It is not just religious liberty, but certainly religious liberty is where many authoritarian leaders target their repression. And we know that those leaders who are willing to, to go against international standards on religious freedom or other human rights are very willing to go against international standards on national security. And so what we have to see is when we look out around the world and we look at the international landscape, we have to say those countries that are willing to, to, to stand against against international standards are willing to do it and then they are therefore a threat to both the security and the values that we hold. The second is a limitation of religious freedom as a source of radicalization. And Mary Beth talked a bit about um, violent extremism, terrorism. I spent some of my time at the State Department working on counterterrorism, so got to see many of those issues closely. And what we see is that in many places where religious freedom is limited, and faith communities are targeted for repression by authoritarian governments, in those places, people of faith do not have space to exercise their normal religious freedom. They don't have place to worship. They don't have the freedom to raise their children and to, to speak about their beliefs. And that makes them much more prey 
to the radical elements of their faith that are looking to say, no, 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 here's, here's the path to being able to express yourself about our faith. It doesn't mean the entire faith by any means is radical, but what it means is that the fact that people don't have that space to, to exercise their religious liberties um, is, is, is fertile ground then for the radical elements that would then seek to use violence and other, other means which make us a less stable community. Last point that we've seen and it's concerning is the manipulation of religious community by populist and authoritarian leaders. So what we see is many undemocratic leaders around the world wielding religion as a, as a weapon to advance their own personal objectives, whether by co-opting belief in their rhetoric or harnessing violent extremism. And it's a way to hold on to power because what we see with populist leaders and authoritarians, they don't want to actually subject themselves to the will of the people or subject themselves to the ballot box. So how else are you going to gain support? And the best way to do it is to divide a society and bring people in through less democratic means. And so autocrats know that it's, it's much better for them um, to divide than to unite um, a, a, a society. And so by dividing societies along religious lines, they are able to weaponize the difference we have, stoke animosity, and build loyalty to themselves and to their regimes. But I will end on one note of faith, of, of hope and, and opportunity. I do think, and we heard it both from Secretary Pompeo as well as from Mary Beth, is that this is just an opportunity for us to remember that religion and has to be an element of all of our analytical um, frameworks and people of faith, whether they are religious leaders or people of faith that are operating in the secular community, it's so essential that they are integrated into our national security framework. They're integrated into um, the negotiations that we have. And, and in the best way, and, and Mary Beth touched on this as well, in a proactive way to prevent conflict, to be sources of um, building uh, better relations between communities before we even get to a point of um, instability or conflict. So I'll stop on that point. And Thank you, Nicole. Time. That's yeah. really helpful, and there's so many things we can follow up on. Yeah. Lord Alton, you very possibly could be the only one on the stage today who is officially sanctioned <laughs> by the People's Republic. Um, so. I told Sam Brownback that I'd been sanctioned, and he said, what kept you so long? And <laughs> my children, who have been sanctioned with me, set up a WhatsApp group called Badge of Honor. And I felt very proud of them for seeing it in that way. I'll talk a bit, if I may, Mary Beth, about China in a moment. But I just start by saying that if you don't understand the state of religious freedom in a country, then you don't understand very much about that country. If you do understand it, you get a pretty good view of the condition of that country, its stability, its prosperity, its outlook. The basket cases in the world, everywhere from North Korea to Pakistan, these are countries that don't allow religious freedom. And look at the consequences. Look at the mass exodus of people from places where there is conflict. There are more, according to the United Nations High Commission on Refugees, more than 70 million people who are displaced worldwide. What is it they're escaping from? What is it they are fleeing from? Ask Ahmadis fleeing from Pakistan. Ask Christians trying to get out of northern Nigeria. Ask the Uyghur women that I have met, who very few of them have been able to get out of China, but those who have about their stories. And you understand why people join the mass exodus, which leads to massive destabilization around the world. And in turn, that I think is an example of religious illiteracy amongst many of those who make policy at the highest levels in our liberal democracies. And they have a lot to answer for, for this blind spot. I'm gonna give the example, if I may, of Nigeria in a moment, of where there is massive religious illiteracy and I think that we need to push this right up the agenda for a whole stack of reasons. One of them is because countries like our own and many of your countries, of those of you in the auditorium today, are signed up to the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the work of Eleanor Roosevelt and many others who sat on those committees with her in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. It was born out of the ashes of Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen and the other horrendous concentration camps and those millions who had lost their lives in the Holocaust. 
It was an attempt to try and rectify our failure to prevent these things and to stop them from, in the famous oft-repeated phrase, happening ever again. Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says everyone has the right to believe. They also have the right not to believe and the right to change their belief. And we see that being breached every single day. It's an orphaned right around the world. And I want to know why it is that others who believe in the fundamental principles of human rights do not stand up for religious freedom in their legislatures, in their parliaments, and in the highest corridors of power. And they need to do it not just because it's the right thing to do, not because of the wicked things that are happening to people who are being persecuted, but they need to do it also because it is a harbinger of worse things to come when you ignore it. It is the canary in the mine. It's a barometer, and we know what barometers do. They measure the future patterns of weather. And if you look at what's happening with religious freedom, you get a pretty good idea of what's coming your way. So let's go back to the two examples I mentioned, and then perhaps we can unpack this a little bit more. I mean, Nicole's got a lot more, I think, is she's already said a lot, but is of real value, and I personally would look forward to hearing more. Freedom House is an organization I have huge respect for. In the case of China, I first visited China as a young member of the House of Commons in 1980. In my city of Liverpool, where I was a member of parliament, we had a large Chinese community, people who had escaped from Mao's China. Remember, 50 million people had died during the Cultural Revolution or through the wicked deeds of the Chinese Communist Party. So you know, this is not a story we're unaware of. We know what they are capable of, and leopards don't change their spots. In 1980, I got to Shanghai, and I saw, still imprisoned, but able under then under house arrest to come to a window each night, a man who had been 40 years in jail. And this was Bishop Kung of Shanghai, Cardinal Kung made a cardinal in pectore in secret by John Paul II. This is a man who suffered grievously. I know Cardinal Joseph Zen well. He is a truly good man. I would say that he is one of the greatest Chinese Christian leaders. He's been arrested, as you probably all know, in Hong Kong. Many of those in prison in Hong Kong today where we see the destruction of democracy, huh, guess what? They come from religious Christian backgrounds. I know Joshua one personally. I've chaired meetings for him. He's a young man who comes from a Christian background. He's in prison. I know Jimmy Lai personally. He founded Apple Daily. He is in prison. Why? Because they uphold the rule of law and they believe in the kind of universal values contained in that Declaration of Human Rights I referred to earlier on. They believe in democracy as we do. Who doesn't? The Chinese Communist Party. And they are subverting the international agreements that were made in the case of Hong Kong. They threatened Taiwan on a daily basis. We know what they did in Tibet. We know what they do to any dissident or defector who dares to speak out. Think of that young Chinese Christian woman who went to Wuhan to try and shine a light on the origins of COVID-19, Zhang Zheng, who is festering in a jail. Or Pastor Wang Yi from the... Uh, the, the, one of the Protestant free churches who is in jail because he dared to question some of the ways in which the country is governed. Think of forced organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners and others. And think of the million and more people in the Uyghur re-education camps. So Jeffrey Nice QC chaired the Uyghur Tribunal. He was the prosecutor in the Milosevic case. He knows a thing or two about atrocity crimes. They found just six months ago, having had a year of taking evidence in London, they found that there is a genocide underway. Mike Pompeo, to his credit, on the day before the previous administration went out, named it as a genocide. Tony Blinken coming in in his place, named it as a genocide. The House of Commons has named it as a genocide. But has that impacted on our trade? Has it impacted on the way we treat China? Has it impacted with the policy makers on the way in which they deal with a country that has surveillance technology all over Xinjiang, the same company that makes it produces cameras, that company, Hikvision, banned here in the United States, not banned in the United Kingdom. Why isn't the CCP's companies which operate in our nuclear industry in the UK, why has it not been taken out? As we've now eventually taken them out of things like Huawei taken out of our 5G networks. Why did it take so long? At one level, you could say it's naive, but at another level, you could say these are collaborators in treachery. 
And I think that it is the latter in many cases, that people just saw money as a prospect, regardless of what it would do to industry in their own countries, when slave labor is used to manufacture goods, which will always outcompete what you can do. This is extraordinary to my mind. It removes resilience and it creates subservience. Look at the United Nations, the way in which the Security Council is now compromised by the presence of China able to use its veto along with Russia whenever they wish. But China also on the United Nations Human Rights Council. It's a sick joke. It's a sick joke. Look what they've done through the Belt and Road Initiatives across Asia and Africa, which Mary Beth was referring to earlier on. This is truly extraordinary that we have allowed these things to occur. Where have been the policymakers? Didn't they see the canaries in the mine? Didn't they look at the barometer? Weren't they looking for the harbingers? And let me just end by saying something as well about Nigeria. I took part in a session last night. It was an honor to be with Bishop Jude, who saw 40, 40 people in one of his churches just within the last month murdered because they dared to practice their faith. I've taken evidence from people who have suffered grievously. Only last week, I was there at the unveiling of pictures that a talented young woman has painted of Rohingya women, Yazidi women, women from Afghanistan, women from Ukraine, and women from Nigeria. One of the pictures was of a lady from Nigeria who had been raped, not once, but twice, in front of her husband by Fulani militia. They and Boko Haram are responsible for most of the atrocities. That lady was eight months pregnant. Mercifully, her baby survived. And she named what she called her miracle baby, Gloria. Sitting alongside the lady who's written Leah Sharibu's biography last night, whose name also happens to be Gloria, sitting alongside Maryam Ibrahim, against, uh, with, for whom I campaigned many years ago when she was jailed in Sudan. Look at Sudan, what happened because of religious ideology and what it did in South Sudan, where two million people died, and Darfur, which I visited, where 300,000 died, two million displaced. Why? Because of the attempt to impose an ideology. And read across into Nigeria and what is happening now, and then you can see the picture. But you won't if you suffer from religious illiteracy. And that is why, Mary Beth, this isn't just a nice to have, though it is. It isn't just that it's Article 18 and we ought to honor it, though we should. It is because it gets right down into the quick of where our national security interests lie. And those policymakers who don't get that do not understand the world. We have very few, uh, thank you, both of you. We have only two minutes left and I I do wanna raise one, I, I think, ray of light. And that is the Abraham Accords. And if Secretary Pompeo had been here, I think I would have asked him to just talk a moment about how the religious tolerance in the Gulf countries in particular um, that has now dovetailed into their formalization and informal relationships with Israel are at least one ray of hope where religion can play a positive role and and also be uh, a basis upon which uh, people can gather together for other things. So closing out, speed dating, just a little bit, I think we can conclude that the the violations of religious tolerance and using religion um, as a canary in the cold mine to basically escalating, diminishing human rights by authoritarian regimes and others um, is underappreciated in our national security and needs to be formalized. Um, Both of you, two or three points on a way forward to make an impact, um, looking at ways in which there needs to be a change about this intersection of international religious freedom and our national security policies. Nicole? Absolutely. Um, I would start with um, having democracy at the center of our foreign policy, which would allow the respect for all of the human rights and not just a selective group, um, and having religious freedom as one of the elements of a democracy. Us having democracy and supporting democracy abroad is central to our foreign policy because it serves our national interests, it serves our values, it serves our economic interests, and we can't divorce it from our foreign policy. I think also this issue of bringing people of faith and bringing religious leaders into the conversation early on to make um, 
literate religious leaders as part of the conversation a real, um, a real um, amplifier of an understanding as well as an impact that can be had. Particularly on the ground. Exactly. Lord Alton. Exactly. I could do no better than echo that because it's about religious illiteracy and it's pushing this up the agenda, which is why conferences like this one and the ministerial happening next week in London are so important. We have to take this issue off the margins and make it central so that it's in the DNA of policy making. When you get people in Nigeria being told that the reason why 30 people were murdered in that church, why 11 people were executed on Christmas Day, why women like the woman I described were being raped by people from radical Islamist groups. But that is all down to, as some have said, including even the president of Ireland, who should have known better, that this was down to climate change or even population growth or poverty. This is absurd. This Name it for what it is, and then you've got some chance of doing something about it. Uh, name it for what it is. It's an ideology that needs to be challenged. So that would be, for me, a priority. And good people, including Muslims, will stand with us on that platform. That's why I campaign for Rohingya Muslims. It's why I campaign for Uyghur Muslims, because Article 18 is about everyone. It's why I'm a campaign for atheists, like Alexander Ahn, who was put in jail for four years because he put on his Facebook site that he didn't believe in God. He has a right not to believe in God. We don't have a right to impose our faith on others. We don't seek to do that. And we have to name things for what they are. So the harbingers, the canaries in the mind, for goodness sake, let's get that and push this right up the agenda. And let's take examples of people and stand with them like you're doing at this conference. I brought Chen Guan Cho to Westminster to speak about what this blind man with no eyes had seen through his heart about what was happening in China. It's people like Chen who are able to show the world what they have missed, what they haven't seen. We have to do far more of that. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who was murdered by the Nazis who said not to speak is to speak, mm -hmm. not to act is to act. Never let that be said about us. Mm. Thank you so very much. Let us have the courage to call it for what it is. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you.